Hi friends, welcome to another episode of Ask Nurse Alice, the show where we talk about all things health, wellness, love, and lifestyle, and I give you all the tea with no copay. So guys, I'm always excited about this show. Um, but before I get started, I want to send a big thank you to Inclusive Media. They are the production team behind this. So thank you for making this possible. So follow them on Instagram and as well so you don't miss an episode of Ask Nurse Alice. Make sure to go to your favorite podcast platform and subscribe, like, follow, all those wonderful things so you don't miss another show. Um, and also while you're there, share it with a friend because sharing is caring. Now, along the lines of sharing and caring, uh, how many of you have found yourself in a relationship where absolutely you are sharing and caring, but to later find out that maybe the person you were sharing and caring with might have still been sharing and caring with someone else? I know, sounds complicated, and it is, because we see those relationship statuses all the time. It's complicated. Or you might have heard the term situationship. Heck, some of us might have been called a side piece, unknowingly, right? No one, most people don't step into those situations knowingly. Uh, but there's actually a new terminology that I want to talk about, and many of us came to know this word, entanglement, um, as Jada Pinkett Smith brought herself to her own red table with hubby Will Smith to talk about an extramarital relationship she had while the two were on a break. Now, I know, it, we, we, don't, we don't like to really, I don't want to really sensationalize you know, this extramarital relationship, and that's not what I'm, what I'm gunning for, but I really want to talk about the, use it as an example, because I think many of us have found us somewhere along our lifespan in one of those situations, um, in one of those roles. So who else better than to talk about this subject other than America's relationship expert, Dr. Wendy Walsh. Guys, she is an award-winning TV journalist turned PhD of clinical psychology. She is America's relationship expert. She's going to help us break this down. You've seen her on every different television show. She adds her own podcast on iHeartRadio. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Wendy Walsh. Hi, Dr. Walsh. How are you? Hi. So nice to see you, Nurse Alice. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time. Um, I know you're busy with a lot of things. You're also a, cl a clinical professor um, teaching courses at Channel Island and a lot of yes, other I things. I teach at Cal State Channel Islands and have a radio show on iHeart and my podcast is called Mating Matters. Oh, and it does. It definitely does. <laughs> it definitely does. So, Dr. Walsh, if I could just go ahead, um, you know, we've as America, we've we saw this um, extra. I don't, and I don't even like the word extramarital relationship. Is there something wrong with that? That I don't like that word. It seems it has. So it seems like a a really really bad thing. Are those always bad things? Well, I mean. The questions you're asking and the reason why you're asking about language and labels is because our Western culture is undergoing a metamorphosis in relationship styles and uh, the boundaries of relationships. And I think if we just take morality out of the question, instead really ask what is natural for our species, what happened in the evolution of Homo sapien to make us be the most successful species on the planet in terms of mating strategy, then I think we're getting to what really matters. So let me just start by saying that we have the widest range of sexual behavior of any primate species. So we also have the widest range of parental investment, particularly paternal investment. So you know, one guy's investment in his kids might just be one teaspoon of sperm, and another guy's investment might be he's a baby-wearing, carpool-driving, softball-throwing, doting dad, right? And we have everything in between. So as far as monogamy is concerned, in the same thing, we have almost 50% of humans who stay monogamous for the lifespan, but another 50% who practice serial monogamy, who might practice um, polyamory, who might practice, you know, some new mate selection, we call that dating, in between periods of monogamy. And I think the thing that's really driving this change is the extension of our life expectancy. You know, we're just living longer. When Till Death Do Us Part was invented, death was pretty imminent, right? Oh, no. And so the average length of a marriage, if you got married in 1900, was 12 years. So we just kept getting healthier and we kept living longer and people are dealing with 
their desires for um, a more interesting sex life. So a short answer is, let's take morality out of it and instead ask ourselves, what does my culture expect of me? What have I been taught in my early life about relationships and monogamy and bound sexual boundaries? And what's really right for me? And then to learn how to be able to communicate that to your partner and find a partner who matches that is of course the big lottery win. <laughs> exactly, a, a, definitely a lottery win, but you gotta uh, play uh, to win. And I think because of the very many things you mentioned, some of us are afraid to play because I, you know, I grew up with both of my parents. They were married for a very long time. That's what I grew up with. That's what I saw um, in many of my, you know, friends, parents, relationships. So that's what I know. And so that's what I've come to expect. So when I see um, the variations of relationship styles, um, it's not for me, but I, I don't know that people are always quite honest and upfront when they meet someone and expressing what is okay, what is not okay, um, because there's also this whole um, concept of you shouldn't have expectations of other people. So it's kind of like, oh, oh yes, gosh. you should. <laughs> well, you know, they say, well, I'll, and maybe these are people who just don't want to live up to your expectations that say that. But um, when we bring it back, so let's let's look at uh, Jade and Will Smith. Like they were relation, and they are still relationship goals. You know, you've seen it hashtag relationship goals, and we saw this what looked to be like a perfect seamless marriage, and then. All of a sudden, R&B singer August Alsina, you know, he's, he obviously comes out with an album. That's a whole nother story, right, as far as his, as his timing of releasing this information. But I, I watched his interview, and he's, a, he's much younger than Jada uh, by almost, I think, 15, almost 20 years. He's about the age of her, her children. And to hear his story about how much he gave to this relationship and how broken he was after, you know, after it had to come to an end because Jada and Will stayed together. I just can't help but think that Jada used him as a rebound relationship um, and that it really, you know, is, is that really fair for people uh, when they're having issues in their relationship, which Will and Jada were on a break. They were amicable. Mm -hmm. And as she referred, she got into an entanglement. When you're on a, having issues in your current relationship, is it ever okay to kind of have that, you know, explore whether it's even if it's not physical, emotional relationship with someone else. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, far from being a moral authority on people, I'm more likely to provide some context to help people understand what could be going through the minds of people. Let's start at the beginning. None of us should ever compare any of our relationships with the relationships of Hollywood celebrities. You know, I often say that narcissistic personality disorder is not only accepted in Hollywood, it's often a requirement. So when two people come together who are both in the limelight, you tend to be people who are very high need people. They're trying to compensate for something that happened in their childhood, some missing piece of mother, and suddenly the entourage and the limelight becomes that necessary mother. So they're often not as good at care, <clears throat> excuse me, caring for each other in relationships. Now, this is not to talk specifically about Jada and Will, but just to say in general, that's why we shouldn't compare ourselves with Hollywood celebrities. But the other thing is, now let's talk more about Jada and Will. The rumors have been swirling for years that they had a quote unquote open relationship on both sides. They had every reason to keep that a secret, even in fact it was true. One is um, the um, unfair and terrible stereotypes against mm -hmm. black men and women, the sexual mythology that they're highly promiscuous, right? And so they want to establish themselves publicly as what they perceive the, the culture says is a healthy family with monogamy. The other thing is they're raising kids, right? And so a revolving door of parental figures we know is not good for kids. So keeping this out of kids' eyes is important too. And of course, if it becomes public, then the kids know about it as well. Um, and then the, the idea that the two of them in their own are on their own prickly path to trying to figure out how to uh, make a relationship work for the two of them. So I, I don't wanna say that she used this young man I would say that during a vulnerable moment in her development, and sadly she's in the limelight, so we all get to know about it, 
Um, she used sex for one of the things many humans use sex for, which is a stress reducer, which is a, an ego booster, which is a way to get your self-esteem back, uh, a, may, a way to just experience pleasure when you're feeling down. I mean, sex is the closest thing we have to a drug, right? It actually affects it the brain in the yeah. same way that a drug does. And so I, you know, I don't damn her, I don't damn him. I can just look at their situation and say, they got quite a Rubik's cube to figure out to keep that family together, to be good parents, to be good public people, to be representatives of black couples, whatever the heck that is, right? But you know, there's a lot of pressure on them in many ways. And on top of it, then they're bringing into the relationship, you know, maybe some trauma from their childhood that made them attracted yeah. to the limelight in the first place. Yeah, and in, in the interviews, uh, and Jada said that she was broken. She was very unhappy and hadn't been happy for a long time. And that's when her, her uh, new friendship, uh, entanglement, whatever you want to call it, uh, started to bud with August. And it seems like he also, too, was coming from a broken uh, background. He had recently experienced the death of his sister, his brother. He had taken in children, their children as his own. He was struggling with his own career and also had health challenges. So a lot going on. Um, why is it that it seems that Broken people, and I hate to use that word because, but I'm just oh, gonna be, I know I where know. you're going, and you're right. <laughs> why, why do we attract one another? It's almost like I don't, I, I can't face my own problems and fix myself, but I want to fix you. I want to help you. And that makes me feel good, even though I'm still all tore up from the floor up, crying on my pillow at nighttime, but I still am attracted to helping someone else. Why is yeah. that? Why do, why do we act that way? Before I answer that question, which is an excellent question, by the way, I just want to say that let's also be reminded there's a little bit of sexism in the media's coverage of this, because in that interview, when she said, oh, you have gotten back to me, it was clear that he'd had multiple sexual relationships, too. And nobody's focusing on that. It's always when a woman steps out that everyone makes a moral thing around it, but not when men do. So let's just leave that That's there. That's true. Let me answer That's your true. question. So uh, we all grow up with a kind of attachment style, right? And our attachment style is partly genetic predisposition, how we come into the world, and then how that biology um, intersects with our primary caregivers early in life. So if we are, if our model of love is filled with longing, abandonment, criticism, violence, abuse, that's still familiar to us. And we will go out and seek partners who fulfill that. So this is why you will find people with attachment disorders kind of attracted to each other. But I also want to say that Sigmund Freud said there are two defenses against psychic pain. One is humor, and we know that most stand-up comedians yes. are fighting depression and a host of other things. And the other is sublimation, where you take your pain, you find somebody else who has a similar pain, and you attend to it. And as you're caring for them, you're also self-consoling in a way. And so I think that Maybe this relationship was partly an act of sublimation for her. And I just want to say one thing while we're talking specifically about this relationship. I think the best thing about the media attention to this was that here is a couple who came out publicly to show the repair of their yes. relationship, to, to, to mention that they've been in therapy. You know, this is the best thing for famous couples to do is to say they've been in therapy so that it becomes a model for others but also to show that an affair doesn't mean the end of a relationship. It's usually a symptom of the problem and then couples can work through and get to this place where they are definitely friends and care about each other. Yes, I, I saw that, I noticed that in their interview um, and I thought to myself like, wow, because for some people when things like that happen, it's the end of the relationship, that's it. They leave, they walk out, but they actually took the time to work through things now and apparently this relationship with august was several years ago four and a half five years ago so um it probably is a little bit of an insult to some of the work that they've done i imagine they've worked through this whole process <coughs> to have it reintroduced how what are some suggestions you might have for couples who maybe something happens you work through it and everything seems okay but there's a repeat incident or a reminder of something that's happened into the past how do you not let that destroy all of the work that you've done to progress. Well, if nothing else, this is a reminder to couples in America 
that no act of sexual intercourse is a stand alone, no strings attached, no feelings or emotions attached event. And when you have sex with somebody, you leave a piece of yourself in them, right? And they carry that too. And they can come deal with it in their own way and their own timing and their own schedule and stuff can come out. There are no secrets. There are no standalones. I also believe that the unconscious knows all. I think that when one partner is having an affair, the other partner needs to use a lot of psychic energy to defend from the feelings that they know. They know on some level that something's going on. But your question was really about what happens when it comes back later to bite you in the butt. And if you've already done the work, then it should be easier the second time around, right? It's like, uh, you know, people who may quit smoking and uh, they have to quit three or four times before it's finally permanent until they just say, no way. But, you know, every time it comes back, it's a little easier because they've gone through the steps uh, in the past. And so I think that, you know, I think the biggest difference this time around was how public it became and they weren't prepared for that. But I, I do think the work of them working through it as a couple has already happened and it was easy to just re-talk through. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And um, the description you gave uh, earlier, we refer to, many people refer to that as a soul tie. Once you, like as you said, had sex with someone, there's a piece of you that actually stays with them or they stay with you and you carry that on into your next relationship and other things. It, yeah. it, it changes you. It makes you, you know, yeah. t- helps to develop you. Now, now we've, we've talked a little bit about Will and Jada. Now the, the gentleman, August Alsina. I listened to an interview that he had with Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club, and he seemed very hurt and betrayed, um, which rightfully so. Um, I th- and, and again, I've, I've not talked to August Alsina, guys, so I'm just, from what I can gather, uh, you know, very young gentleman, seems like Jada was the love of his life, he'd given his all, and that now <laughs> that he's loved like this, he's okay to die. I mean, how does, it's, it's hard to walk away from a relationship when you love someone. Um, and well, he said it almost killed him. So how do we, well, go ahead, go ahead. I just, I just don't know. Let me I, say this. <laughs> of the two partners in that dyad, Jada and he, uh, Jada had the higher mate status. She was more famous, richer, more beautiful, could help him in his career. Of course he fell hard. Uh, she was his ticket to everything in life. So of course, uh, he was going to be the one more brokenhearted. In every relationship, I mean, you hope in every relationship that both your mate statuses are about the same and that both co- both partners feel like they got a catch, right? But too often it happens that one person's the big catch and one per- person's the lesser catch. And yeah. so one person loves more than the other. Yeah, um, everyone's looking to be, become a power couple with someone. Uh, they, they do want that equal or greater match because together they can even be better. So, but um, do you think that uh, the way that he's expressed his anger, or his feelings through music and art, I mean, he's an artist, he's a singer. Right. Um, he's expressed a lot of it through his music. He actually recently did a song with rapper Rick Ross called Ent- Entanglement. And I was listening to the lyrics of that song and he's, and there's a, a particular lyric in there uh, and I don't know, ex- I can't remember ex- word by word, but he basically referenced him, himself feeling betrayed that you uh, you left him to be with me to only get back at him and how messed up that was. So he feels, at least from the, that song, it sounds like he feels that he was a rebound relationship. Um, Do you happen to know what came first, the lyrics entanglement or her stating it on the Red Table show? Oh no, it was all afterwards. So the song was, the song, the, the whole terminology entanglement became famous after she said it on Red yeah. Table Talk. So I'm imagining he heard that and felt like he needed to respond because, you know, maybe he <laughs> didn't feel acknowledged or he felt maybe be- his, that his part in her, re- in her life was belittled. I don't know, but the song came after the Red Table Talk. So, and, he has, and he has some music to sell right now. This is beautiful marketing, beautiful marketing. Uh, so I will say that. And yeah, and and yes, uh, musicians, artists put their feelings into their work. So this is part of his process of healing. Any suggestions for someone who's maybe not an artist, not in the limelight, um, that has have found themselves in a situation similar to August, where maybe someone they they started dating someone who had recently come out of a relationship, 
and it doesn't work out and that person goes back to the initial person. Any suggestions for them so they don't feel so bad? Because it, it, it can be uh, a terrible feeling to feel like, oh, wow, I was just filling the void for you. How fair was that to me when I was really loving you? Because I've heard well, those stories. Well, my advice is the same advice I would give to anybody who's recovering from a breakup. Um, I'm sorry if you were a, a rebound relationship, but there are all kinds of reasons why people break up. And the way that we cope, of course, is to number one, surround yourself with people who love you just for you, your close friends, your long-term friends, your family, even colleagues and coworkers. Uh, don't run out and do another rebound yourself. We now know that that's just delaying your grief, right? Yeah. Also take the time to grieve. And then also look at your own patterns. Why are you choosing people who kind of are slightly unavailable, who tell you from the beginning, they've got one leg back in that other relationship. What is it about you that made you choose that person? so that you can change your patterns for next time. And the most important is completely disengage on all social media with them and their closest friends, because you don't need to be taunted and tempted with pictures of he or she back with their ex. Yes, I, th I think that's one thing that um, many people will agree with they should do, but have problems doing it because they have that kind of in the back of their mind, maybe they'll come back, maybe. And you know, that's just the worst feeling. I feel like people are torturing themselves uh, when they do that it's really hard to let go of someone that you love still yeah. even if it's for for those reasons so um when we're when we are exploring relationships um what are some key things uh that we should be asking or talking about when we initially meet someone to find out if they are truly a match uh for me so i mean should i be asking how do i ask about emotional baggage without just coming directly <laughs> and saying it like are you in and out like do you have one foot still in another relationship and you're i mean how, what's the best way to ask that well first of all um we're a little um optimistic if we think we're going to find somebody who does not have emotional baggage all we want to do is get to know somebody's craziness and hope their craziness is a good friend of our craziness right yeah. uh and and i think certain things you want to ask are about i mean you as a nurse practitioner certainly know about adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And I wish dating profiles could just put somebody's ACE score because <laughs> then we'd learn so much about them. But, you know, ask them about, you know, uh, and this is a road to intimacy as well. Maybe not on a first date, but a few dates down the road, ask them about early childhood life um, and whether there was violence in their household, drug and alcohol use, et cetera, what that experience was like for them emotionally. Um, and look at their relationship history. I mean, if somebody is in their 30s and they've never had a relationship that passed one or two calendar years, then there's an issue, right? Like, why are they not able to stay connected with people? What do they not trust in relationships? You know, relationships are really good for our health. And even though this idea of marriage and happily ever after was really created during a time when uh, women were disadvantaged and they needed marriage for economic reasons and men used it to control women. So now we have a time where we actually have this you know, oversupply of highly successful women who are independent, who make their own money, who don't need marriage, right. but we do need love and yes. we do need connection. And we do know that long-term committed people have better health, both mental health and physical health. They have, um, they live longer mm -hmm. and, and they have, they accumulate more wealth because it's way cheaper to maintain one house than two, right? Yes, for a variety of reasons, it's um, healthy to be uh, in a relationship. And I think, um, and you're right, people, I'll say women, and because I'm a woman, but you know, we, I was raised to think of, you know, marriage, a home, a family, like this picture perfect thing. and now I'm seeing more and more people who are who've kind of delayed marriage or they're mm -hmm. divorced and don't want to remarry, but they still want companionship. But there's a fear that I'm going to get I want to get married because then I know that we're together. And if we're not married, that there's a potential for breakup when that really shouldn't even be the case because it's just a title. Or is it more than just a title? I know I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for what I just said, but I just, I'm asking no, no, I know what America's you're asking. relationship experts. Yeah. 
we are at a crossroads in our relationship styles. And we have, you know, our society is actually built around couples. Couples get better tax benefits. They get better health care. Oh, they accumulate more wealth. Um, the legal profession favors it. The tax profession favors it, right? So our, our, a lot of the structures in our culture were set up when we particularly socialized as couples. But now we actually have more single adults in American culture than married adults for the first time in history, right? Wow. So some of these adults are cohabitating. Some of them are just dating or living uh, in separate houses, but still very much committed and monogamous, right? And so we have to kind of throw out this idea of a developmental schedule. Now, women, of course, have the biological imperative. If they want to become mothers, their choice is to freeze their eggs or um, get pregnant before they're 35. I mean, I, I don't have to tell a nurse what happens yeah. after that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that pressure on women to try to get a partner who is going to stay long enough to help and nurture these children, whatever definition of that. Be. Some people feel safer, it's marriage, etc. But aside from that, you can find love for the first time in your life anywhere on the lifespan as you continue yeah. to grow and learn how to be a loving person. You know, my best friend got married for the first time in her life at the age of 50 and wow. is so happy. They've been married seven years now and she's so, so happy. Uh, I know another woman who got married for the second time in her life at the age of 70, right? Oh. And she's been single for 30 years. Oh, keep hope so, alive for me then. <laughs> yeah, so there's no, there are no rules. I think the constraints yeah. come when we put them on ourselves except for that biological rule. Um, you know, if you do want to have kids, you, you got to get on it and figure that out. Right. Oh my gosh, this has been so great. I almost feel like it's therapeutic for me. Um, <laughs> but, and the guy, and um, for those who are watching, uh, I have, uh, we have Alex and Theo in here and they've been just as equally engaged too. Like, oh my, and they're men. Not that men yeah. don't, don't care about relationship stuff, but. Oh um, my gosh, men care about relationships more than women. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, he, he gave a thumbs up. They do. Because well, women, they, okay, men benefit more than women in relationships. Men's health goes up, their mental health and their physical health. Women get double the burden of work because we tend to do more childcare and domestic responsibilities. Yeah. So in fact, after divorce, women do better than men. The other reason relationships are so good for men is, you know, as women were acculturated to build a village who are our emotional support team. We have girlfriends and even co-workers that we confide deeply with. Men are acculturated to not show their emotions with other guys. That's changing now, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and so they tend to put all their emotional eggs in one basket, and that's with their primary romantic partner. And so they literally need that lifeline, that an emotional lifeline more than women do. That's so true. And Dr. Walsh, if you could see, see, they're like, yes, 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 they're listening, they're listening to you. This is great. This has been some great information. Uh, now, Dr. Walsh, I mean, we, we've had you for about 25, 30 minutes or so. Where can people find, uh, you know, find, listen, read more yes. information from you? Because this has been like a tremendous, this is like a free session, guys. And, you know, you know, uh, counseling visits aren't always uh, Aren't always are, can be expensive sometimes. Sometimes insurance doesn't pay for it. And I have to say, this has been like the mo one of the most <laughs> therapeutic sessions I have ever. It's had. a relief. To, it's yes. a relief to throw the rules out the window and just figure out who yes. you are, separate from cultural pressures. And Absolutely. you know, sometimes who we are is to be a loving, committed, long-term monogamous person. And that's absolutely okay. So I wanna to say to young people out there, if you're being pressured to join the hookup culture and that doesn't feel right <laughs> to you, then don't do it. I mean, there that's not, it's not a pressure too. Um, okay, so people can follow me anywhere on my social media and that would be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and that's all at Dr. Wendy Walsh, just D-R-W-E-N-D-Y-W-A-L-S-H. My podcast, Mating Matters, you can find wherever you listen to your podcast, and it's all evolutionary psychology and what we're naturally programmed for. And then I have a radio show on KFI AM 640 Los Angeles every Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time, and you can listen to it anywhere around the world on the iHeartRadio app. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. And then your IG Live, is that, is, do you, is that a weekly thing that you do? Yeah, so every Wednesday at six o'clock, I do a live stream on all my social media. 
and I let people ask any questions. And I started doing it during quarantine and I'll probably be doing it forever now because it's uh, assaging my loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't go anywhere because now we're like, oh my gosh, I actually get to reach out and ask my question. And um, you guys, she's great. I mean, I was, I was on Instagram live popping in, chiming in, and it's been, it was been great to listen to what everyone else has to say and the topics are just so wonderful. So you guys, if you've not you. already, please, you have to follow Dr. Wendy Walsh. She's amazing. Again, America's relationship expert. And just from this podcast alone, we've learned so much to better understand that. And she said it so eloquently, guys, because I know sometimes I get stumped. And when your feelings get in the way, you get stumped with what to say and how to express yourself. So the way she explained things was perfect. I mean, I'm, I probably have to go back and listen to it and I will write down exactly what she said so I could use that language. But, um, you know, to help us better understand that it's not just, you know, like she said, marriage um, till death do we part. When that came about, people were living shorter lives. And so it just, paint, you know, really opened my eyes to a, a lot of information to not beat myself up or uh, empower my friends and family to not beat themselves up to with their relationship is issues. So, yeah, you know, I do want to say, Nurse Alice, before I go, that uh, the, the one word that I hate the most in our culture is when people describe a relationship as a failed relationship. Oh, there is no yeah. such thing as a failed marriage or a failed relationship. A relationship is over when the partners have learned what they needed to learn. Yeah, that's good. Thank you so much because we beat ourselves up about that. We think that we yeah. did something, you know, we did things wrong and, you know, and like you said, it's, we learned, we learned from it. So we adapted. Um, so that's good. Don't beat yourself up guys. If your relationship doesn't work out, learn what you need to learn to be a better person, to move on, to love someone else and to love yourself. Don't beat yourself up in the process. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Wendy. We really, really appreciate it. Everyone, make sure you follow Dr. Wendy Walsh. She is amazing. Um, and please make sure that you uh, go to your favorite uh, podcast channel, follow Ask Nurse Alice. Again, this is a show where we talk about all things health, wellness, love, lifestyle, and all of the tea with no copay. Like this was a perfect session and you don't have to pay a copay to speak to a clinical psychologist. I mean, come on now. Where else are you going to get that? So again, um, guys, until next time, Live well, wash your hands, wear your masks, and take care of one another. Bye, friends. This has been an Inclusive Media Podcast Studios production.